Sue Abadie. I'm the director of the Hollywood Bureau. And welcome to the 22nd annual Impact Me convention. Our theme this year is our sacred honor, fulfilling the promise of America. This is our first in-person convention since the pandemic, and it's so nice to see all of you here today. And I really mean that from the bottom of my heart. Um, inshallah, whatever you experienced the last few years, you are healing and are stronger for it, inshallah. 35 years ago, this December, Impact was founded by Dr. Meher Hatout. May God bless his soul in peace. Mr. Abdul Hamid Yunus and our president, Salam al Mariyadi. When many Muslims in the community were debating whether or not it was haram to participate in the American elections or whether or not it was haram to eat Skittles, Impact was busy creating the American Muslim identity an identity that is rooted in the fact that there is no contradiction between being a proud American and a proud Muslim, and that there's no contradiction between the Quran and the US Constitution. This year's plenary session is pretty much in line with MPAC style, addressing the tough issues we are facing as Muslims, non-Muslims here and abroad. We have a duty as Muslims and Americans and as citizens of the human race to get it right or to go down trying. Our faith has been misaligned by others and by our own, and therefore today's panel, the weaponization of women working towards an inalienable rights is a conversation we choose to have. Fair warning, it is going to be an intense and deeply thought-provoking conversation, one that only an all-female panel can pull off. <laughs> Today's discussion will be followed by remarks from Connie Rice, one of our nation's premier civil rights lawyers and leaders, who we are honored to also have sit on Impact's leadership advisory board. After the panel, I want to encourage you to visit the Impact booth outside, and I ask that you continue to support our work through your generous donations. Now let's get started by introducing our moderator, Lena Barakat, who will then introduce our esteemed panelists. Lena Barakat is the president and CEO of the Women Donors Network. Lena is a grassroots activist and a movement builder. She earned her master's degree in global development and social justice from St. John's University in New York. She completed her certification in advanced project management from Stanford University and holds a BA in international studies from the University of California, San Diego. And I just want to stop and say, MashaAllah. <laughs> it makes me so proud to also say that she was an MPAC intern years ago and where we learned so much from her. Lena is one of the most kindest, most loyal people I know. Her dedication to God, her family, and her friends is really what defines this incredible soul. Please help me welcome one of my dearest friends, Lena Berakat. Thank you, Sue. I, am I turned on? Okay. Thank you. I didn't know you were going to read, read my bio. Um, it's so good to be here with all of you all. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Um, as, as Sue introduced, my name is Lena Berakat. Um, yes, I'm a, a mother, an activist, um, a working professional. Um, and before I wore any of those hats, uh, I took my very first steps in civic engagement and really fortifying my identity as a Muslim woman um, and activist and justice seeker right here um, at IMPAC as an intern in 2006. And I'm just incredibly grateful to Salam, Suhad, um, and the Impact team and community who really invested so much in me um, at a very young age um, and really forged the path to what I believe where I am today. So alhamdulillah, thank you all so much. So today we are going to have an incredibly important and timely discussion. Um, we'll be discussing how the recent attacks on our fundamental liberties as women is really inherently connected to our um, to threats to our democracy, threats to our privacy, and how that impacts our communities. We're going to be exploring what our role is in this conversation and in these fights as Muslims, 
and as Sue alluded to, how these two seemingly opposing notions um, talk, in our, in our opinion, and thanks to the experts and panels, uh, panelists around us, um, are frankly not opposing at all. And we're really excited to talk through with you um, what, what the conversation on uh, addressing um, you know, the landscape post Roe versus Wade. Um, and I just want to name that this is a topic that for our community is a very difficult one. So I want to just name that this is, this is we're entering um, you know, a different space here together, one that I trust. I trust in our community to navigate together and, uh, and as we unpack what the impacts this is having on our community and really explore from an Islamic lens, from a justice lens, from a medical lens, what, um, what, our, role, what our role in this conversation is. And I want to be very clear. We are not interested in uh, influencing and defining your personal views on this issue. This remains personal. How you make decisions on your bodily autonomy is absolutely your choice, and we have no, um, and, and in line with, and should be in line with our faith's values. And what roles, and, and under, by understanding the context of the impact these bans, the government bans on, uh, on abortion and access to safe health, uh, safe, sorry, safe, safe access to health care for women, the ripple effects that this has. Um, and our question is, should governments be playing a role? in that and what is our role as Muslims in this conversation. So to help us unpack, um, and so to say that this is for us a very difficult conversation and we want to really respect um, you know, your perspectives and point of view, we are gonna be addressing this very candidly and we're not going to be censoring our, our uh, research and understanding of this knowledge and fully understand if this is something you're not comfortable being a part of we absolutely respect that, and you're right not to participate in that. But my ask of you is that you trust, you trust, and that we lean on each other um, for trust in this in this conversation. Um, and in, to help us unpack a very meaty conversation on this, we have experts. This isn't just us spewing opinions on the matter, but really deep expertise. Um, and I'm with that. Um, and, and let's give some, with that, I want to introduce our panelist, um, Asifa Landis Qureshi, Qureshi Landis, who is a legal expert on US constitutional law and Islamic law, and also serves on the advisory council of the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Dr. Raja Khan, who's the executive director of the American Muslim Health Professionals, also a close member of the Impact Family and Community. And of course, without saying, Dr. Leila Mariotti, uh, who is an OBGYN doctor herself and oversees um, cl uh, clinic at U USC. I'll let her speak more to that when we speak. So mashallah, a really incredible lens of expertise on legal and Islamic matters, on, on public health and um, field practice in this work. And to give some context on where we're at in the landscape, you're welcome to sit down over here. We want to move to the right. Thank you. To give some context on, on the landscape, since Roe versus Wade was overturned and the bans were instilled, 13 states in the US have placed uh, bans on abortions, with an additional 15 states that are set to follow. This is over half of our country. And this banning access to safe and legal health services causing a major crisis that is increasing rates of maternal mortality, risking the lives of many women, and further exasperating the racial, economic, and gender injustices in this country. And I'm really excited to unpack what, what that looks like and what that means for us. Knowing that much of, the, much of the criminalization that is happening of women, increased criminalization, is targeting our communities, black and brown namely, of which we identify. So this next hour is meant to deepen our understanding of these complex issues and consider the context and the longer term impact that these political measures on our communities are having on our communities before defining our stances on them. Separating the personal decision making process from that of the role of government in that and connecting that to understanding how, does, how do these measures set dangerous precedent in our democracy. And with that, I'm, we're gonna have uh, a robust conversation over the next hour. I'm gonna be asking each of our panelists to begin by introducing themselves and sharing a few opening remarks. 
And after they share their opening remarks, we'll dive into some discussion, okay? All right, Asifa, we'll begin with you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Is this on? Good. Assalamu alaikum. It's really lovely to be back here. It always feels like I'm coming home when I come to MPAC, so it's really lovely to be here. Um, I'm a professor of, are we good? Is that feedback? Is that okay? Okay. I'm a professor of constitutional law, U.S. constitutional law, and Islamic law. So I'm coming at this from that perspective. You can look up my bio. I think the bios are somewhere you yes. can read, so I won't go into a lot of detail. But over the past year, I keep hearing people say things like, what does Islam say about abortion? How many have heard something like that? Like, think that, wonder that, heard people having that conversation. And I'm frustrated with how we tend to ha answer that question because I think we're mixing concepts and don't realize that we're doing that. So I think we need to ground ourselves with some, some key concepts. I'm working on a book on Islamic constitutionalism, so that's also what I'm bringing to this conversation. So a little Sharia 101 here. <laughs> so first of all, as you know, the interpretation of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ gives us Muslims an understanding of how we should live our lives, right? What to eat, how to get divorced, how to write a contract, how to deal fairly in the marketplace, how to treat our families. These are things that come to us from the fuqaha, the scholars of fiqh, which is the understanding of sharia, God's law. And that's done by individual scholars who are interpreting the Quran and the Sunnah to give us those answers. Because not every detailed question is answered specifically in the text, so you need to do a little bit of work to give you those answers. Yeah? This is all familiar, right? The thing that's really amazing to me about how they did that work was the fuqaha were aware of their own fallibility. They knew that they were human and that in that interpretation they could be wrong. And so we, from that, have a diversity of schools of fiqh, which you're also familiar with. And the way that they interacted with each other was to recognize that any result of, of true ijtihad, of intellectual reasoning, based on looking at Quran and Sunnah that's done with, with sincerity, is valid, even if they disagree with each other. So a grounds for divorce in one school but not in the other, that's fine. We have a heritage of diversity of interpretation living in a community together. We think of that diversity not as a problem, but as one of God's blessings of ma built, making us into nations and tribes. And so the idea of figuring out how to live with that diversity without becoming violent and hateful toward each other is actually our heritage. It's actually our jurisprudential heritage. The entire corpus of Islamic law is a testament to that principle that unity does not mean uniformity. And we embrace the differences and learn from those differences and still have the choice for ourselves to choose which school I want to follow. That whole thing, by the way, I think, as we see our culture and country fracturing around ideological differences to the point of hatred and violence, to me, Muslims should be the leaders in showing everybody how to do that because we have a history of doing that, of disagreeing with each other on the meaning of God's law. And still, we are a community together, and we can work together. Even the scholars of these different rules appreciated, you can disagree with me, and that's still a valid interpretation of God's law. So I would love us to be an example of how to do that. Um, we could do more of that. Anyway, that's our heritage. That's the gift that the fuqaha gave us. That diversity created a very unique constitutional structure that a lot of people don't realize because it was basically erased during the colonial era. So I'm going to give you a little bit of my research on this. And that is that they had to preserve this diversity. They had to preserve that individual Muslims had access to choose whichever school they wanted. And if you think about it for five seconds, you realize that that means that the state can't just pick one and impose it on everybody. Because if they do that, then where's everybody's choice? So they did a different thing. They separated the types of law in society. So the fiqh, the different interpretations of the Quran and the Sunnah, was one area of law and was very diverse. And by the way, they, anyone mostly could choose between which school they wanted to follow. That was different than what the state was doing, what the, the Arabic term here is siyasa. So what the authorities who had physical power over the land, their authority was definitely not about interpreting Quran and Sunnah. Their authority, as the fuqaha spoke about it, was to serve the public good. Masah amma is how they talked about it. And so their job was significantly different than the job of the interpreters of the Quran and Sunnah. Now, I'm not describing a separation of church and state. I don't talk about siyasa as a secular, a religious thing. It was their Islamic duty to do the public good. That was their responsibility as Muslim rulers to do the public good. All right. Um, so 
the whole constitutional structure historically, again, before the colonial interruption, was to have two types of law in society, fiqh and siyasa. Fiqh was about, again, what do I do in my own life? How do I live my life as a Muslim? And siyasa was what the state was doing, the ruler, the caliph, the sultan, the king, whoever, was to order the, the public space and to serve that in the public good. All right, so what does all of that mean for us today? Here, the siyasa, the entity that's deciding the laws for the land, that's now a democracy. We live in a democracy. So we as Muslims in the United States, we have a voice in making that siyasa. So what's my Islamic duty as I go into the voting booth, if I were an elected official or if I were a judge, my Islamic duty when I'm deciding on the law of the land for the public is to look around and say, what's in the public good for America right now? What's the best healthcare system? What's going to cause harm in our educational system? What's going to be better for our economic equality? These are questions of siyasa. So they need to be decided not based on interpretation of Quran and Sunnah, but on what is in the public good. This is an empirical question, and anybody can be a part of that. But the general Islamic value is, it's my job to look for the public good as my role there. So that's really important to separate that from that's different from what do I do in my life? This is the different question. This is what should the state do? So now, um, on the question of abortion, because that's a specific topic we've chosen for today, what does Islam say about that? Well we have to remember which part of the question we're answering. So the question of what do I do in my life, what do I do if I got pregnant, that's a question of fiqh. That's a question of how do I live my life as a Muslim. So I go to whichever school of thought I choose to follow on the interpretation of Quran and Sunnah on this question. As it turns out, many of you may know this, but it turns out there's actually diversity of opinion on the question of when an abortion might be permissible, under what circumstances and at what time, just in general. These are all interpretations, different readings of the Quranic verses that describe when the soul is breathed into the fetus. So the diversity of interpretations over what that date is, ranging from 120 to 80 to 40, all the way down to zero. So depending on your school of thought, an abortion is not killing a life if it's done before that time period. And then they talk about the different circumstances that would be you know, okay, permissible, moving on to different interpretations as we go forward. All, by the way, say that it, abortion is allowed at any time if it's to save the life of the mother on the principle that existing life takes priority over potential life. All right, so that's fiqh. But all of that is not the same thing as asking what the state should do. So what the state should do is a question again of what? Yeah, yeah. yeah. and what do you, what's the siyasa supposed to be based on? Public good, masa amma. So what we are supposed to do when we're looking at what the state should be doing on these questions of abortion bans, we as Muslims should be asking, not what would I do if I got pregnant? We should be asking, what is in the public good of America? Right now, right here, given our econ economic situation, our racial diversity situation, we need to look at what harm and what benefit is coming out of these abortion bans, which, like she said, are popping up all over the country. Um, that is an empirical question where you're trying to evaluate what's the harm and what's the good of these bans. That is something I'm not qualified to talk about, but luckily, we have people who are. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Ghada, we would love to hear from you. All right. <laughs> well, assalamu alaikum, everyone. It's great to be here. And I wanted to thank uh, MPAC and the Stellar team for actually putting together this conversation. This is a much needed conversation. Um, and again, we're, we're talking here and we're discussing this from different perspectives. And for me, as a doctor of public health, I'm bringing the public health perspective. And public health perspective public health by its nature is social justice and in the interest of everyone. And based on what uh, Asifa just mentioned, it's the maslaha amma and the public health is a sahal amma. So what I'm gonna walk you through today is um, just what does ab abortion look like when it comes to what's happening on the ground in the US. What really is, is disheartening about uh, the conversation around abortion is just how much misunderstanding and misinterpretation uh, is is really uh, uh, just making these conversations more difficult, but it's also making it a very polarized and stigmatized issue, which it should not be. This is still in the public interest and the public health. Um, so I'm going to just uh, talk about what uh, abortion 
looks like in the US, what are the stats, um, and just walk you through how it looks. It is really a real issue. It's not a, an issue that happens somewhere else that's not um, relevant to anyone. It, it's actually a real health issue that's happening on the ground. We know that um, about three out of 10 women in the US uh, uh, have an abortion before the age of 45. That's almost a third of women in the US. It's, a, it's happening and it's part of life. Um, women are in their 20s are actually the most uh, or the highest group that have abortions. And we know that 60% of women who have abortions already have children, so they're already mothers. So these stigmatized issues around um, um, abortion being uh, uh, an area of um, associated with premarital sex or that it's um, uh, based on promiscuity or that it, it's associated with incompetent parenthood or in, incompetent mothers isn't really the case. It's an issue that is facing every uh, many women in this country. We also know that um, um, about 14% of women who do have abortions are also married. So it, with this being a real issue, what this really is telling us is that the same people and the same women who become pregnant are also the same women who at some point in their life had an abortion. So this is basically the landscape of how things look like. Um, but when we look at abortion itself as uh, a procedure or a medical issue, it is really an essential life-saving um, healthcare service. Because women undergo abortion for various reasons. It could be because of um, they have a planned or unplanned pregnancy, or they're going through a complicated pregnancy. It's not just, again, that stigmatized uh, idea of what an abortion is. Even the clinical term for abortion includes this wide range of procedures done to terminate both a viable and non-viable or at-risk at pregnancies, but it also encompasses the aftercare of uh, problems such as misca miscarriage or um, a treatment of a uh, self-induced abortion or um, a self-managed abortion. So it's life-saving care for someone in need of that care, depending on their cir life circumstances. So all these various um, pregnancy outcomes that fall within the abortion, um, uh, the abortion boundaries are really issues that should be personal and they're medical in nature. So a woman's views on abortion um, should be determined by her own circumstances, her own belief, her own Islamic values or faith values, and should be between her and her doctor because of the, the different outcomes and the different variability of what abortion is. But let, let's take a, a step to how abortion plays out in society. We know that abortion is also a health equity issue because the context in which these bans are happening is uh, the context of a health system that is filled with health inequities, disparity, economic disparities, social disparities. And we know that all these bans and restrictions are gonna eventually impact the most vulnerable populations. Um, because uh, studies show that abortion bans don't just stop them from happening, they actually make them happen um, in, in an unsafe way. And it shifts the balance about who gets to have an abortion and where they get to do it and at what cost. Um, so we know that these, uh, these laws and restrictions are going to uh, impact the health and well-being of who? When we're looking at the numbers and the, and, and the uh, analyses, it's gonna impact black and brown women the most. Um, and we know that this equitable health system needs to be in place in order for all of us to thrive. So this doesn't just become a women's issue, it becomes an issue of uh, economic 
stability. It becomes an issue of social justice. Um, and see, so when we see a law that restricts access to abortion to a select number or a select group of individuals, then these laws not only restrict access to reproductive health and care, but also exacerbate, exacerbate all the existing health inequities that we have in, in this country that are shaped by social, economic, and political determinants. And um, these have generational consequences, unfortunately. Thank you so much. Very happy to be here. Um, uh, I am a part of the Impact family, literally. Uh, <laughs> but I'm also currently a clinical assistant professor of OBGYN at Keck School of Medicine at USC, and I've been a practicing obstetrician gynecologist for over 25 years. Um, so I want to sort of make this a little bit more personal, to tell some stories, to bring this home to, for people to understand. Um, why this is not a simple, straightforward subject, and why there's much bigger issues that we should be focusing on if we're really concerned about women, their children, living or unborn. And so, uh, but I will just tell you that uh, as I started out my career, I felt it was really necessary for me to figure out what was my role and responsibility regarding all aspects of reproductive health care so that I took care of my patients while staying true to my own values. And obstetrics and gynecology, this comes up all the time. Um, I thought the choices would be clear and straightforward and black and white, but over the course of my career, I discovered that I live in a world of gray. And, but I did, in my quest for knowledge, find out some very important facts that have sort of guided me and also helped me understand what the landscape is, some of which uh, Asifa had mentioned already. Number one is that contraception in all forms is permissible in Islam. I know we're talking about abortion, but right after abortion and taking away abortion rights, birth control is next. And, and this affects all of us. The fact that contraception is allowed was mind-boggling given the time that it was not uh, the same for the early Judeo-Christian traditions and even now, for example, for Catholicism. But this is a foundational principle that sets Islam apart. It must be understood. The Quran discusses phases of development of the, of the fetus, that God breathes his spirit into the unborn child at some point, but doesn't say when. The Hadith are specific, giving time frames of 40-day increments. So as a result, early scholars from all of the major schools of thought agreed that human life or ensoulment began somewhere between 40 and 120 days of gestation, or 5 to 16 weeks, which is like one you know, first month up to the fourth month. This book, called The Sex and Society in Islam by B.F. Musalam, really enlightened me on what this, this diversity of opinion among scholars was that I had really not known before. Many scholars considered first trimester abortion a form of contraception and did not even weigh in on whether or not it was legal. Because the fetus was unformed, it was living like a blade of grass, or, but it was not formed as a human. And this distinction was important for them. Uh, they agreed that abortion is allowed in all cases to save the life of the mother and to ensure survival of living children who take precedence over the unborn. There is debate, however, about the permissibility of abortion in cases of rape or incest, unfortunately. Um, one could argue that first trimester abortion isn't even subject to the above criteria in the first place based on its permissibility according to the early scholars. However, most modern scholars and indeed a lot of sort of the community knowledge uh, considers uh, that life begins at conception and therefore abortion is not permissible at any stage. This is not a consensus view, but it is, it is sort of the predominant view, I think, that is prevailing. There is no precedence that I could come up with, and Asifa can weigh in on this later too, that refers to abortion per se as a crime. However, according to Hadith and legal interpretation, if a pregnant woman is killed and, she's, and her pregnancy has reached the form stage after 16 weeks, 18 weeks, then, you know, in Islam, you had to pay blood money to the family of the deceased and you owed it for both her and the child, but not if she was under 16 weeks pregnant. And so, but there is no notion of abortion itself as being a criminal act. It was really the status of what happens if a woman is killed and her fetus is killed at the same time. So I just wanted to share some stories with you. These are composites of patients I've cared for over the years, not any one particular individual out of respect for their own privacy. 
um, that reflect that the easy answers I was looking for would elude me completely until I realized that what truly mattered most was the well-being of the pregnant person sitting in front of me. And that is really the bottom line. These stories may cause some of you to feel uncomfortable, could trigger personal memories, some trauma, and if you feel like you would rather not participate or listen, that is completely understandable and we would like you to care for yourself. Because I'm not mincing words. This issue is too serious now for me to do what normally would be to be more polite in, a, in this kind of setting. But we can't. There's too much at stake here. So the first example, and I have several, but I won't read all of them, uh, is, is a 35-year-old woman who has a two-year-old child. She's now pregnant at 16 weeks, about four months along, and she presents to the hospital with leakage of fluid. So all of you have heard of that, right? Her bag of water broke signifying that you know, labor has begun. However, the fetus still has a heartbeat, but in medical terms, we consider this to be what is called an inevitable abortion. It cannot, uh, the outcome cannot be good. Once the bag of water has broken at that stage, infection is going to set in, and therefore we recommend to terminate the pregnancy immediately, pregnancy immediately and start antibiotics. But she happens to be in an emergency room at a Catholic hospital here in California, not in another state, that does not allow any intervention as long as the fetus has a heartbeat. So after three days in the hospital, she goes into septic shock, has to undergo emergency surgery, resulting in the removal of her uterus. She did have the one child. Um, she gets multiple blood transfusions and is admitted to the ICU with organ failure. I'm not exaggerating. I have lived this experience. It's terrible for everybody. Uh, next case, well, this one might strike closer to home, but let's say we have a 19-year-old Muslim college student living on campus, has met and fallen in love with another Muslim student. They are planning to wait to become sexually active, uh, but they get into a situation where one thing leads to another and she finds out she is pregnant. They were ambivalent about obtaining and using birth control because that would mean they were planning to have sex. So this is the thinking of a 19-year-old. She's overwhelmed with guilt, shame, and regret, and goes to a local clinic where she obtains medication for a first trimester abortion, goes through the miscarriage by herself in her dorm room. She's afraid of telling her parents because she feels they would be angry and disappointed. She can't concentrate on her schoolwork afterwards, becomes seriously depressed so that she drops out of school and returns home, much to her parents' confusion. This is not an exaggeration. Lastly, one last... Um, case and then we'll move on. This is a 39-year-old woman who has already has two children. She's in a relationship with an abusive husband. She has been exploring ways to escape with her children but she has not been able to come up with the plan. So her husband goes to all medical appointments with her and has not allowed her to use any birth control ever uh, and she's now pregnant at about three months. So the intensity and the violence and abuse have increased. She does not want to bring another child into this situation and is torn about what to do once she manages to leave the household. I want to also point out, and this goes to some of the issues that Rada was talking about, some of the ramifications of forcing people to stay pregnant, that in um, cases of domestic violence and abuse, data consistently show that acts of violence against pregnant women increase at the hands of their abusive partners, who often target the pregnancy itself with direct trauma to the abdomen, whether hitting or stabbing. This has been shown time and time again. Um, and I just read another article recently that reminded me that homicide is the number one cause of death of pregnant women before hemorrhage, high blood pressure, sepsis, the three most common reasons women die in the United States, usually due to gun violence. So there's this intersection also about guns and violence as well as pregnant women. So these situations are unique, but not that unusual. My goal was not to shock or upset you. Um, but I just feel like there's, people's lives are hanging in the balance and it's time to, to, to be bold and to be strong. Are we willing to step in to help these families in concrete ways? Uh, if we feel it's our right to vote on access to abortion for all Americans, is that really going to make a difference for these stories, for these individuals? Or are there other things that we can and should do? And I think that's what we want to talk about, how we can do something as part of the public community to help women, children, born, unborn, whether it's uh, advocating for universal daycare, for universal health services, mental health services, um, family leave, living wages, uh, prenatal and postnatal care. All of these scenarios are situations where sometimes there's issues we didn't even talk about access to care in the first place. 
Um, and sometimes I have other stories that can, can go into more detail about that if we're interested. But uh, thank you so much for your time. And These are real stories. And to underpin something Dr. Layla said is that it hits close, closer to home than one might think. Many people in this room have been impacted by stories like this themselves or closely around them. And again, this is not a conversation to influence your personal decision making in these matters, but rather consider that of the broader community and the benefit of the public good when governments and the risk of what it means when governments get involved in these decisions. And so with that, I'm going to take a pause if you all want to take a deep breath. We're going to go into the conversation. Asifa, you spoke eloquently about contextualized decision making. There's really no one size fits all. And these are not black and white issues. And therefore, you cannot apply black and white rules by, 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 by governments and systems. Can you speak a little bit more to how the Islamic, uh, how our existing infrastructure and systems inform better decision making and more contextualized decision making and what examples, uh, other examples do you have outside of this that might um, hit home? Um, so I think you're thinking about my, my distinction about FIC and CS and how yes. other ways we can think about that. Um, so yeah, abortion is just the latest version of this in my mind. I actually do this in my head when I go to vote, which I hope everyone will be voting. It's one call yes, to action. Right, exactly. <laughs> so I, um, I think about okay, what, what would I do? And then I stop and I was like, this is not about me, this is about everybody else. And so I always look at what is the impact of this particular policy, what does this person's platform mean in my community, in my particular local community, who's better for the educational system or the healthcare system in my, in my area that I live. That's what I always force myself to think about because it's very easy to go back on, well, how will this affect my, you know, value of my house or something like that. Like that's not the question. The question is what's for everybody. And it, this goes a little bit to my point about I wish Muslims would lead in working through diversity and embracing it and learning from it. I really wish for a day that people say, oh good, the Muslims are here. They care about everybody. That's not our reputation right now. Our reputation is they only think about the stuff that matters to them. They're only whining when something happens to Muslims. I want us to be known as the people who step up to stand for truth and justice and the good, even if it's nothing to do with me. If it's somebody else's issue, we're there because it hurts them, and we're there to stand and body block the pain that's going to happen. And I, 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 I just think. All of our trauma of Islamophobia and everything else, the better way to get at that is to change how we interact with our environment itself. And the thing that's so frustrating to me is that it is our Islamic duty to think about the greater good for everybody else. That's what we keep forgetting, and this exactly happens with this. So, so I think about healthcare, I think about economic, I think about police brutality, I think about um, you know, legalization of drugs. Like what, it's not about whether I would take the drug, but how is this particular law being used to oppress the most marginalized in my community? And if changing that rule would help them not be so oppressed, then that's my responsibility. So those are the kinds of things I think about. Other, it's not just abortion, it's all of these things. And how would you connect that to, especially with the, the precedent that this is setting um, yeah. in our democracy? How, how, how do you think about so, that? So I don't know. I mean, I don't want to get too lawyer-like here, but, but, um, but <laughs> both of us are. Yeah. So, so many people just heard that Roe versus Wade was overturned, and they don't actually know the legal basis, the constitutional basis of why and how they did that. And just in a nutshell, it goes to the part of the Constitution that talks about liberty, that that privacy over your body and your family is one of the things that the court has, for decades, interpreted as part of your liberty. And the right to contraception, the right to raise and teach your children the way you want to, the right to marry who you want to, regardless of race, the right to access to free, access to safe abortion is, was also one of the liberties found in the constitutional provisions. What the court did in Dobbs versus um, Jackson Women's Health was to question the entire chain of reasoning of what does 
com what comes with the idea of liberty in the Constitution and to question the entire chain of cases about privacy. So that's what they mean when they say it's not just abortion, contraception is next. Like literally it is because it, the, Roe versus Wade was an outgrowth of the cases finding you have a liberty interest in uh, access to abort, uh, uh, contraception. So, the, and, the, and they were not mincing words. The, 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 dissent, the dissent says they're just getting started. They actually said this in the okay. dissent. They're just getting started. So all of the other cases that potentially could happen are just getting teed up all around the country right now. So we need to think about not just whatever you feel about abortion, think about the legal ramifications for all these other issues that maybe you do care about. Thank you. And Dr. Khada, in your, in your opening statement, you talked about how banning these abortions doesn't actually eliminate need or access to them but in fact actually increases harm and increases the risk and um, health and safety measures of women and the ripple effect on our communities. Can you speak a little bit more to how that is? Yes, uh, of course. And so um, the, when, when all the studies show that when you ban abortion, and this is not just in uh, the US, this is also on a global scale, when, wherever banning a, a ban happens on abortion, there's an there's, it doesn't decrease the number of abortions. It actually uh, increases the number of unsafe abortions. And it, um, the, the negative outcomes of this are, are beyond what, what the actual restriction puts in place. So we're going to see an increase in um, self-managed abortions, where uh, women who really need this um, intervention would actually inflicted on themselves or, um, and those privileged can go to states, can just drive to states that have, um, that don't have any bans or don't, um, or have the money to actually do this uh, in a proper way and Take not do it. Take work and have yeah. their kids taken care of while they go. Exactly. Oh, it's only the privileged who are gonna have access. It's the Correct. privileged yeah. few who get yeah. access. Um, also, making a, uh, someone go through, um, someone, let's say, with pre-existing health conditions who finds out they're pregnant and then they have to see the pregnancy to term just because they cannot uh, get an abortion automatically puts them at risk. Uh, Leila shared some stories and it, even when um, complications arise during pregnancy, then that can't be addressed at all because, and, and that puts women at an increased risk, not only of, of morbidity and, and um, detriment to their own health, but actually death. So anytime we see forced pregnancies, you're going to see an increased number in deaths. And, um, and that's, that's what uh, there's an issue with here. But also, we're talking about um, all these outcomes of injury and harm disproportionately impacting uh, black and, and, and brown women and, and communities, minority communities that actually already have limited access to health care. So we know that um, uh, in, the, in the US, black women account for about 38% of abortion patients, um, and that's Partly because, again, they have lower access to health care and contraception. And, and the next step, as Asif mentioned, is that um, taking away that contraception access, which is already lacking in many communities of color. And without that full range of reproductive health care, then they will suffer the most illness, the most uh, morbidity, and the most mor uh, mor mortality. We know that the US currently is um, uh, the highest, has the highest maternal mortality rate than any developed country. And that's a shame on us to have that uh, to begin with, but we do know that we currently are seeing a black maternal mortality crisis where um, uh, black women are three to five, four times more likely to die during pregnancy than white women. Native American women are two times more likely. Hispanic women are three times more likely. And, and these, again, these issues are going to impact these women most. And studies show that even though um, 
with this ban on abortion, that maternal mortality uh, uh, percentage will increase among uh, black populations to up to, uh, there'll be a 33% increase. So these are things that um, we need to think about when we're thinking about our, com about our communities our, our, uh, and our support for health equity. Um, black women uh, also disproportionately live in states that are, um, that fall under the banner of pro-life, but yet these states refuse to uh, expand access to medical care, uh, such as Medicaid. And so um, these are the states that already have bad health outcomes or dire health outcomes, and we're gonna just see an increase. Um, we also have seen research that shows that uh, poverty rate is also gonna increase by 20% as a result. And things like you mentioned criminalization, we know that uh, criminalization happens more among black and, and brown bodies. So policing, that uh, stigmatization, around, uh, stigmatization around criminalization is going to happen more within these communities. And regardless of race um, or, or socioeconomic status, no women should actually be criminalized after going through any type of abortion, whether it's planned or unplanned. These are very personal decisions that have an impact on women's lives and they shouldn't be um, faced with uh, being put in jail at that time because of that decision. Uh, but we also know that it's going to um, lead to all these uh, increased unjust surveillance of, of uh, black and, and brown women's bodies, but it also strips women of that reproductive autonomy. Right. So when you are asking um, if, if a woman knows that she's <laughs> not going to, um, she might be criminalized if, if for any reason she has a bad uh, pregnancy outcome, then they're not gonna be seeking healthcare to begin with. This is all gonna fall under the radar and we're gonna miss uh, protecting these lives that we actually need to protect early on. So you're saying that in addition to increasing the environment for health and safety of women, which women are part of families, part of communities, the ripple effect, you're also talking about increasing criminalization of those same people. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And their doctors. And their and doctors. Their doctors. Yes. We didn't talk about that, the criminalization of doctors who participate. And on that note, there's and th these measures also are requiring, um, you know, a breach in, in their oath and doctor's oath to informed consent. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you know, I wanted to speak, pick up a Please. little bit on what yeah. Kata's talking about. The couple of the other stories I wanted to tell are specifically related to this issue of access. This sort of real, this cruelty of these states that are supporting the abortion bans, but yet refused to accept any funds during the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare to expand Medicaid, which would increase the ability for women to get prenatal care. And also, not only do you see in these cases, you'll see the ripple effect of problems for the women themselves, but also if they have higher uh, premature birth rate, the impact that's going to have the state on taking care of premature infants and all these things that affect the children themselves. So, so an example is a patient who comes in. She was unable to find a doctor to accept her insurance. She has Medi-Cal HMO. This is all happening in California. That's the only place I've ever practiced. So she wasn't seen until she was 18 weeks pregnant, and she missed all of the blood testing that is done to, to rule out any kind of genetic abnormality, um, because it has to be done before a certain period, a certain point. Her ultrasound was done at five months and noted that the fetus had an anomaly, which is called anencephaly, which is the absence of the cerebral cortex. So the baby just had the brain stem, but the brain itself was missing. So the baby could stay alive in utero, breathe, looking like it was breathing, but as soon as the baby's born, usually within a few hours, sometimes a few days, maximum maybe two weeks, the baby would die. So she and her husband are distraught over this. Again, this is a couple going through this, not just a woman, and are choosing between continuing the pregnancy to term so they can offer organ donation, speak about the public good, imagine the kind of person that does that, walks around pregnant, everybody's mm -hmm. celebrating her pregnancy, and she knows she's only having this baby so she can donate its organs at the end. This is real. Um, or terminating because it's just too much for her to handle. Who, who are we to judge her? Not, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't. 
Um, another would, a patient, and I've had several similar to this, mostly you know, Latina or African-American woman, 45 years old, she has three kids. In her last pregnancy, she developed a condition called cardiomyopathy, which is an enlarged heart. Heart does not function well. Um, and she's at risk of heart failure and ultimately will be, will be a candidate for heart transplant. She's not supposed to get pregnant ever again. And she understood that, was planning to undergo a sterilization procedure to get her tubes tied. But she's a patient in the county health system, and that's where I work right now. But people who want sterilization have to, at the back of the line, to everybody else who needs surgery for something much more acute and critical. So she's going to have to wait three to six months surgery. Uh, and her husband was going to consider a vasectomy, but his insurance doesn't cover it because it's an elective procedure. And uh, he's unable to uh, afford the cost to pay out of pocket. Uh, they are using contraception, but she gets pregnant anyway. And now she has to face the decision to terminate this pregnancy in order to save her own life and be present for the children that are living. This issue about the mother's life is in danger, and this is where the doctors are like freaking out around the country, is that who decides? And I've heard someone say even on a radio program, well, it's in God's hands, and the, you, the doctor, may say she could die, but doesn't, it, doesn't God ultimately decide? And I said, well, that could be true if you walk into an ER with the stroke. Well, who am I to say? <laughs> So, but it was this weird kind of logic, yeah. but it makes it so that now you have these ethics committees of people debating whether this fetal anomaly is fatal or not, whether or not the woman, what is it? Is it a 20% chance of dying, a 60% chance of dying? Well, if it's not a 100% chance of dying, then she has to, what kind of game are people playing here? And I think that, and doctors are very afraid uh, and, and also do not want to put their licenses on the line. The idea that they could be criminalized, that they could be uh, in a state where, you know, they do a, a, like the first case I told you of the patient who has an infected uterus, I have to evacuate the uterus in order to stop her from dying. But if someone decides that doesn't fit into this paradigm, then, you know, I could be at risk. So I think that um, it, it's possible to talk about this issue in theoretical terms, and sometimes as Muslims we take the moral high ground and come across as kind of judgmental and even self-righteous about what we think the reasons are people get abortions, but that doesn't uh, accomplish anything and it doesn't address these difficult choices that pregnant patients have to make all the time with their doctors in this sort of shared decision-making model that is gut-wrenching for me and the patient, for her herself and what she has to go through, her partner, and for the healthcare team involved. Everybody's really upset. And is it up to the public or politicians to make the decisions? And then do they get to bear the burden when things go wrong? They don't. So that's the point here is to say, this is already hard, what right. we're doing. I looked for those easy answers. I couldn't find them anywhere. I have to take care of my patients. I have colleagues who are afraid, who, who can't, or are afraid of practicing medicine in states. Patients now have to travel just to get the care they need. It's going to be bad, and it's going to get worse. And the government has no role, and we should not think that as Muslims, if you are against abortion, you know, which you may be, that supporting the abortion bans is a reflection of acting out your faith. And what we're trying to say that it is not. We're not trying to tell you what your opinion should be, but the criminalization of this really serious issue that affects women and their families is not the answer. I think that's what we're trying to come, I want, come and, across. And, yeah. I wanted to say something about the people who are pushing these bans. So they're not asking those questions. They're very ideological and abstract about the topic without looking at the specifics. Like and I know points. that because I've read some of the, the, the statements in legislative hearings where they're pushing these bans. And a lot of it, the legislators themselves and the people who in the public are voting for it are doing it because of a particular ideological, very Christian right perspective. It's a minority, even within Christianity, to believe that this is not only absolutely not allowed, but that the state should be involved. And so what I'm seeing is happening is this is not democracy how it's supposed to work. This is not using our legislative process to figure out what works for everybody to make everybody safe and healthy. These are 
particular ideological communities, political parties, groups that are commandeering our democracy and using it to push their particular moral choices that they would apply to themselves and apply them to everybody else. And what I, again, so frustrated about this is I see Muslims often aligning, thinking, well, they seem really moral and they seem really religious. I should be like them. But this is actually the history that we were at the, the opposite end of. That is medieval state church thinking, where you take the power of the state and you use that to impose your religion on other people. That's actually not what Muslims did. We had minority religious communities living under Muslim rule for centuries. When the Inquisition came to Spain, did the Jews go north to France or south to Morocco? They went south to Morocco because they were safer with Muslims in rule because we understand, again, how to do that diversity thing. We don't all have to agree on things. Even religiously, we don't have to agree on, on everything. And the state's role is not to pick and choose amongst those. So we, if we remember the Crusades at all, we should be very <laughs> suspicious when we see Christians saying, in legislative session, this is my role as a pastor. When they say that in a legislative session, this is Kentucky. There's a legal case right now before Kentucky Supreme Court about this. Everybody should be very careful not to align with that group because we know how bad that is. We were at the opposite end of that violence and we know where it leads. Thank you. And this is to really further our position that not only is this, this is really our Islamic duty and our Islamic responsibility to protect the most vulnerable in this country, not just ourselves, and to protect uh, precedent setting in our democracy when you have people like Mitch McConnell or Rudy Giuliani who will have rights and access to your privacy and health care or informing doctors um, to challenge their own oaths on informed consent and misguide and mislead patients, this is a dangerous place to live. And so with that, I actually want to, we have about just less than 10 minutes, um, offer some call to action and before we get to that, I would love to hear any final thoughts from our panelists. Um, closing, closing thoughts. Asifa, you, oh, you said, had us I, on a I, high I, there. I'm like, <laughs> I said everything. Like, just give me um, <laughs> Punch about. Let's go. The only thing I'd like to say is that I, I, you, can, you can Google me. I've been speaking about this publicly since the Dobbs opinion because I was involved in some um, amicus brief um, signatures that, that AMHP joined us on and MPAC also. Um, and um, I was on a PBS News Hour about this. So I'm, I'm out there. And what I am looking at very much, the, the, where this is happening is at the state level now. This is not going to be a Supreme Court thing. This is states making these laws. And so I'm really interested in getting as many Muslims as possible to stand against these abortion bans. If it shows up in your state, if you have friends and family in other states where it is showing up, try to talk about it with them and make a commitment that you will stand against these. Because I really do think this is our Islamic duty to stand against these abortion bans. Again, this has nothing to do with what you would do in your own life if you were pregnant. This has to do with what causes harm in the general good, and that's our responsibility to try to stop that. So um, I think they're going to announce, I, we, I crafted a, a statement, a pledge. You know how you like sign a pledge not to have any more single-use plastic or whatever, stuff like that, right? So I thought, like, if people take a pledge that if I am in the position to say anything about this, I pledge now that I will oppose abortion bans if they show up whenever I have the opportunity. So I have a statement that basically summarizes everything we said today that I think will be accessible. We have a QR code for people yes. to access. Sure, but it's an online petition. You can sign. You can pass it around to people. And I hope to get as many people as possible to sign it. Thank you. Dr. Khadza. So for me, I'm going to go ahead and share our the conclusion of uh, the statement that American Muslim health professionals had put out, which is that we are called on by our faith to continue supporting an equity-centered public health strategy that protects a woman's right to exercise personal choice, champions equitable access to reproductive care, regardless of race, socioeconomic status, or place of residence, and opposed government interferences and restrictions that undermine our constitutional rights so that we may continue to protect the health and well-being of all Americans. Yeah, I, have chills. Um, I also just want to draw your attention to a really important organization called HART, yes. H-E-A-R-T, which has um, recently published what uh, they're calling the, the sex, sex talk. book, the mm -hmm. sex talk. Yeah. Uh, but looking at, from within an Islamic framework, some of these very difficult issues dealing with uh, uh, 
different perspectives of all kinds of Muslim individuals uh, without judgment because I think that's an area that we can learn from because we're so quick to judge. And I think hopefully that just sharing you my own experience to see that, that I don't judge and thank God I don't have to because God is the only judge here. And we are relieved of that burden and we need to understand that when we're taking a position of judgment against other people. I will just end with what I, you know, are the main points of an organization I belong to, which is the American College of OBGYN, which is to tell us that abortion is a component of comprehensive medical care. People need unimpeded access to all medical care. These are things we should all be able to agree on. People may have differing views about abortion, but they must not interfere with the relationship between people, women, and their doctors. That's really the fundamental point. Physicians must be able to provide medical care to people without outside interference. I am very worried about this, um, and, and we, we, we are just waiting to see what will happen. And abortion is safe, and as Vada pointed out, you know, having these patients who find out they're pregnant, they have something wrong, doing a first trimester termination is much easier and safer than waiting until the pregnancy is more advanced because of the physiologic, physiological changes that take place during pregnancy. Um, and so getting care early in pregnancy and being able to make those decisions with their doctor is what's important. Making sure people have access to effective contraception, having men play a better role in participating in contraception. <laughs> That, that's really significant here. Um, and one of the people in my department who's in my division, uh, Dr. Brian Wynn, that's his area of interest, is focusing on the participation of men in contraception. Because even as a Muslim, what I will say is I, I just prefer, if I could do anything, to help prevent unwanted pregnancies from happening. And that if I have a patient and I haven't counseled her appropriately or haven't given her all the options, it's, I feel it's a failure on my part in some ways. But this is for all of us, and having access to that so people can be in control of their lives is really important. And this affects couples, this affects men, women, everybody's at stake here. And we have to sort of focus on the things that really matter most. And this is a huge distraction away that's yes. only going to cause harm. And at the very end of the day, it's going to cause more harm than good. We have to really give it some thought. So there are other acts that, you know, there's the Women's Health Protection Act, there's other going to be uh, forms of legislation, things that people can support. Um, and I hopefully we made the case for why we should be doing that. So, uh, thank you. <laughs> this brilliant group of panelists put together a set of resources that IMPAC um, has put on its website. So I want to give you, I don't know if it's going to be on the screen, but I wanted to give you the link for um, bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash IMPAC resources. Um, our call to action to you is to continue these conversations with your friends, with your family. If you live here in California, this is not necessarily on the ballot, but if you have friends and family members that live in other states where this is, um, have the conversations intentionally with them. Continue to get educated and deeper on these issues, um, deepen your knowledge on these issues. Um, the resources that we posted on the website, um, to hearttogrow.org, is the organization um, that Layla was referring to. There are others, American Health, uh, Muslim Health Professionals as another one. Um, and sign the pledge that uh, Asifa created, and of course, get out and vote. Thank you all so much for joining us in this conversation. Moving forward, I want, I'm very excited to introduce you to um, one of our nation's um, best uh, civil rights leaders, advisor on the IMPACT um, Advisory Council, and uh, co-founder and, and director of the Advancement Project, Ms. Connie Rice. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> it is such a privilege to be with you again. Uh, wow. I come to MPAC to learn, and um, I got quite an education today. I hope that this opened up my, opened up my thinking. I hope it uh, opened up everybody in this room. Um, Faisal and Salam asked me to address you because 
Salam made the mistake of putting me on a Zoom call with the Impact Advisory Council, and we had this marvelous set of presentations on the Impact programs. I mean, it, it, it was just all of the service programs that you have, and all of the new programs that are doing outreach to women, and I mean, they were just wonderful programs. And I weighed in at the end, and I said, that's all very nice, but, but it's beside the point of where we are right now. And they wanted me to kind of recapture that, how I blew up that meeting. Because I have been in a lot of meetings with African American pastors and leaders, with my uh, uh, Hispanic brothers and sisters in a lot of meetings, um, you know, LGBTQ. I've been across the spectrum of the folks who believe in a pluralistic e pluribus unum multiracial, pluralistic, multi-religious democracy, and those who, in the words of our poet, national poet, Amanda Gorman, said the forces that would shatter rather than share the democracy. And I always say, as a lawyer, there's, there's something called an order of proof. You have to put the evidence in an order. You have to know what to argue first, right? or the judge and the jury are not going to be, understand whether you've satisfied all of the elements of the, 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 the right that you're trying to vindicate or the crime that you're trying to prosecute. There's also something analogous in politics, and it's knowing what frame we're in. I call it the order of battle. Now, Dr. Hatut said, Connie, you're a warrior. You use militaristic language too much. <laughs> We are a peaceful religion. <laughs> You're always coming in. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm too old for therapy. You know. <laughs> Even in, I mean, I'm, I'm a litigator, which is a warrior with paper, right? I go into court, right? I'm a Christian. And then in my spare time, I did Taekwondo. There is clearly <laughs> something wrong with me, OK? But I am way too old. I always have my eye on what's the fight. What frame are we in? I love to talk about programs. I love to talk about service, direct service. But ladies and gentlemen, we are in a unique inflection point in American history. We've been here before. But here's how we know that we're in an existential frame. And when we're in an existential frame, we don't have the luxury of indulging our individual groups particular lenses, perspectives, and outlooks. We have to band together. And I was with some African American uh, pastors who, I, I said, I'm not asking you to endorse or live or subscribe to the LGBT community. But if they are under attack, we are next. I don't have to agree with every tenet of every religion, every ideology, every lifestyle. I don't have to subscribe to it or agree with it. I hope we can get back to the day we can have those battles to fight about policy, to fight about statutes, to fight about values. I wish we were in that frame. I wish we were in a policy debate. We are not. We are not. How do you know? Because when it's a clash of values, that was 1968. It was a clash over the Vietnam War. It was a clash of values. It was a culture clash. Uh, 1933, it was another inflection point in this country. That was a clash over economics. But 1860 was a clash over the fundamental identity, the fundamental uh, feelings about truth and fact and fundamental disagreements about power. And right now we're in a battle with a shared power vision, which is what I think this community is about, what my different communities are about, and I've got about 15 of them. I am the great granddaughter of slaves and slave owners. We have Congolese, we have, we have Russian, we have Ashkenazi, we have, I have a UN for a family. Okay, I can't indulge. I don't. I can't afford to hate anybody because they're in my family. All right, 
and we've got Muslim, Jewish, Christian, atheist, you name it, we've got it. One transgender member, I, it is the, the human tapestry in my family. We don't have the luxury, okay? I have so many tribes, but no one of them is more important than preserving the democratic framework so that all of us can be free and have liberty. This is the existential fight that we are in. So we have to create what Martin Luther King Jr. called the Grand Alliance. The Grand Alliance. We can oppose each other later and bicker and fight later, but right now we have to save democracy because why would the great-granddaughter of slaves care about a system that enshrined her bondage, her ancestors' bondage? Why? Because the American democratic framework is the, is, is the only governmental framework that has built into it perfectibility of the union. We correct our flaws and we march forward to progress and enlarge the liberty, equality, and the promise of this country that this conference says is a sacred honor to achieve. That is what we are fighting for. And I, I will share with you a story a year before an assassin's bullet felled him, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was at Harry Belafonte's beautiful South End Manhattan apartment. I've had the privilege of being there many times. It's like a museum to human liberty, liberation movements. <laughs> and it, it, Martin Luther King Jr. had just come from a very dispiriting confrontation with very young African Americans who were with the Black Power Movement. And they didn't want to do peace. They didn't want to do nonviolent protest. They didn't want to do the sort of Christian values of, of, of br trying, to, trying to persuade through love, trying to demonstrate justice and make the moral case for the country so that the shame the country into ending apartheid, into ending Jim Crow, into allowing African Americans the vote and just the right to live. He had led that battle for the country. The country was coming around. But young folks were like, you're taking too long. We want a power movement. And he came back to Harry Belafonte's apartment, and he was very dispirited. And Harry said, what's wrong, Martin? And Dr. King said, Harry, I fear we are fighting to integrate into a burning house. And Harry said, then what is it that we must do? And Dr. King said, we must become firemen. We must fight to save this country from itself. We must fight to realize America, to force America to live up to her ideals and to extend it to all of the human beings who live in this great country. We must become firefighters and ladies and gentlemen, it's no longer a house on fire. We're talking about mega fires now. We're going to have to become smoke jumpers. We're going to have to get those planes and start dropping that orange stuff on stuff. We are going to have to create an army to fight for this multiracial, pluralistic democracy. E pluribus unum is our greatest credo. It is in the seal, the American seal. Those words, of the many one, not of the one one, of the many one, many religions, many races, many orientations, lifestyles, many value systems. But we are one under a pluralistic freedom, liberty, dem democratic vision. Let's unite even with the folks we don't like, okay? I'm not asking you to like folks or is it? We have to join because divided, we will perish. If there is a white nationalist, patriarchal, Christian nationalist frame on this country that is getting power in order to deny everybody else who is not like them power, we're done. The democracy is over. And ladies and gentlemen, you and I, will be on the boxcars to Manzanar too. Because we cannot allow genocidal, annihilative visions 
of you don't belong and you should not exist. That is what that vision is. No, we are e pluribus unum Americans, and we are going to achieve this democracy and the vision of this country, and we are going to perfect this union. We have to join together. We need a battle plan on several fronts, short term, medium, and long term. Short term is next week. We could lose this democracy. It's not 2024. The Democrats are always five years too late and a million dollars too short. I'm not, I'm not a member of any party. My cousin, I'm calling her up because, you know, Condoleezza, I'm like, where are you? You know, get out there and get your people in line. But bottom line, if if we don't understand the frame that we are in and the battle that we are in. So short term right now is galvanizing for, to vote for people who believe in actual democracy, are not trying to end it for everybody. Medium term is the 2024, but it's not just about elections. It is about reaching out to the people who were so whipped into a frenzy of hatred, they believe that we are trying to kill them. If I believed what they've been told, if I believed what they've been told, I would think of us as an enemy too. They have been deprived of jobs. They have been deprived of it. They've been left in a rust belt. They feel like they're looked down on. They're cut out. They're not on television. They're, they're, they're the butts of joke, uh, jokes on television. Their cultures and their dances and their, and their, their, their entire way of living. They got rid of one, one, one of the taxi drivers told me in Appalachia, he said, you erased us. We're not even on television anymore. So stepping into that empathetic shoe, if I were in their shoes and I were whipped into a frenzy with lies, li path, that liaria is a new disease. It's an epidemic, okay? Yeah, yeah, there's, de there's democracidal liaria going on and the big lie will kill everybody, okay? What we have to understand is if we can't persuade, not everybody is unpersuadable, but we have to let them know we don't look down. We do want to include them. I am worried about poor white coal miners who have nothing but black lung disease, and then Medicaid is cut out from under them. We have to care about them too, and tell them we are not out to exclude or annihilate them. We want them to be part of that tapestry. The call to action, let's get they're going to call for a constitutional uh, 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 convention, but they want to get rid of a freedom constitution. We need to be ready with a constitution that actually talks about fundamental rights. The first, right to, the first human right is not the right to speech, it is the right to safety. The first freedom is not the freedom to associate, it is freedom from violence. We can write a constitution that builds in what the doctors and this panel were talking about, the right to shelter, the right to access to health care, the right to, sh the right, simply the right to achieve who you were meant to be, whom God meant you to be. All of those liberties, we could rewrite the constitution, but we cannot let people who don't want us at the table. I tell people, there's nothing more American than being owned by America. I am the descendant of slaves and slave owners. My ancestors died to have me stand here. Join them in a continuing fight for our freedom and for democracy. Thank you. Just one more note about an all-women female panel. We start and end on time. <laughs> Thank you, Connie, Layla, Gadda, Lena, and Asifa. God bless you all. We're so lucky to be in your light. I mean, this was a terrific panel. So excited to be here again. I wanted to let you know that if you are um, going to be praying um, to wash up, the bathrooms are on the left. Prayer pair room is on the right, and then the ballroom is in front of us. So we will be starting at 6.20 on the dot, um, and we are planning for a very exciting evening, a very fun one. 
And God bless you. It is so, so, so nice to see all of you here. It's literally standing room only. So God bless and thank you. And we'll see you at 620. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> it is such a privilege to be with you again. Uh, wow. I come to MPAC to learn, and um, I got quite an education today. I hope that this opened up my, opened up my thinking. I hope it uh, opened up everybody in this room. Um, Faisal and Salam asked me to address you because Salam made the mistake of putting me on a Zoom call with the MPAC Advisory Council, and we had this marvelous set of presentations on the MPAC programs. I mean, it, it, it was just all of the service programs that you have, and all of the new programs that are doing outreach to women, and I mean, they were just wonderful programs. And I weighed in at the end, and I said, that's all very nice, but, but it's beside the point of where we are right now. And they wanted me to kind of recapture that, how I blew up that meeting. Because I have been in a lot of meetings with African American pastors and leaders, with my uh, uh, Hispanic brothers and sisters in a lot of meetings, um, you know, LGBTQ. I've been across the spectrum of the folks who believe in a pluralistic e pluribus unum multiracial, pluralistic, multi-religious democracy, and those who, in the words of our poet, national poet, Amanda Gorman, said the forces that would shatter rather than share the democracy. And I always say, as a lawyer, there's, there's something called an order of proof. You have to put the evidence in an order. You have to know what to argue first, right? or the judge and the jury are not going to be, understand whether you've satisfied all of the elements of the, 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 the right that you're trying to vindicate or the crime that you're trying to prosecute. There's also something analogous in politics, and it's knowing what frame we're in. I call it the order of battle. Now, Dr. Hatut said, Connie, you're a warrior. You use militaristic language too much. <laughs> We are a peaceful religion. <laughs> You're always coming in. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm too old for therapy. You know. <laughs> Even in, I mean, I'm, I'm a litigator, which is a warrior with paper, right? I go into court, right? I'm a Christian. And then in my spare time, I did Taekwondo. There is clearly <laughs> something wrong with me, OK? But I am way too old. I always have my eye on what's the fight. What frame are we in? I love to talk about programs. I love to talk about service, direct service. But ladies and gentlemen, we are in a unique inflection point in American history. We've been here before. But here's how we know that we're in an existential frame. And when we're in an existential frame, we don't have the luxury of indulging our individual groups particular lenses, perspectives, and outlooks. We have to band together. And I was with some African American uh, pastors who, I, I said, I'm not asking you to endorse or live or subscribe to the LGBT community. But if they are under attack, we are next. I don't have to agree with every tenet of every religion, every ideology, every lifestyle. I don't have to subscribe to it or agree with it. I hope we can get back to the day we can have those battles to fight about policy, to fight about statutes, to fight about values. I wish we were in that frame. I wish we were in a policy debate. We are not. We are not. How do you know? Because when it's a clash of values, that was 1968. It was a clash over the Vietnam War. It was a clash of values. 
It was a culture clash. Uh, 1933, there was another inflection point in this country. That was a clash over economics. But 1860 was a clash over the fundamental identity, the fundamental uh, feelings about truth and fact, and fundamental disagreements about power. And right now we're in a battle with a shared power vision, which is what I think this community is about, what my different communities are about, and I've got about 15 of them. I am the great granddaughter of slaves and slave owners. We have Congolese, we have, we have Russian, we have Ashkenazi, we have, I have a UN for a family, okay? <laughs> I can't indulge, I don't, I can't afford to hate anybody because they're in my family, all right? And we've got Muslim, Jewish, Christian, atheist, you name it, we've got it. One transgender member, I, it is the, the human tapestry in my family. We don't have the luxury, okay? I have so many tribes, but no one of them is more important than preserving the democratic framework so that all of us can be free and have liberty. This is the existential fight that we are in. So we have to create what Martin Luther King Jr. called the Grand Alliance. The Grand Alliance. We can oppose each other later and bicker and fight later, but right now we have to save democracy because why would the great granddaughter of slaves care about a system that enshrined her bondage, her ancestors' bondage? Why? Because the American democratic framework is the, is, is the only governmental framework that has built into it perfectibility of the union. We correct our flaws and we march forward to progress and enlarge the liberty, equality, and the promise of this country that this conference says is a sacred honor to achieve. That is what we are fighting for. And I, I will share with you a story a year before an assassin's bullet felled him, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was at Harry Belafonte's beautiful South End Manhattan apartment. I've had the privilege of being there many times. It's like a museum to human liberty, liberation movements. <laughs> and it, it, Martin Luther King Jr. had just come from a very dispiriting confrontation with very young African Americans who were with the Black Power Movement. And they didn't want to do peace. They didn't want to do nonviolent protest. They didn't want to do the sort of Christian values of, of, of br trying, to, trying to persuade through love, trying to demonstrate justice and make the moral case for the country so that the shame the country into ending apartheid, into ending Jim Crow, into allowing African Americans the vote and just the right to live. He had led that battle for the country. The country was coming around. But young folks were like, you're taking too long. We want a power movement. And he came back to Harry Belafonte's apartment and he was very dispirited. And Harry said, what's wrong, Martin? And Dr. King said, Harry, I fear we are fighting to integrate into a burning house. And Harry said, then what is it that we must do? And Dr. King said, we must become firemen. We must fight to save this country from itself. We must fight to realize America, to force America to live up to her ideals and to extend it to all of the human beings who live in this great country. We must become firefighters and ladies and gentlemen, it's no longer a house on fire. We're talking about mega fires now. We're going to have to become smoke jumpers. We're going to have to get those planes and start dropping that orange stuff on stuff. We are going to have to create an army to fight for this multiracial, pluralistic democracy. E pluribus unum is our greatest credo. It is in the seal, the American seal. Those words, of the many one, not of the one one, of the many one. 
many religions, many races, many orientations, lifestyles, many value systems. But we are one under a pluralistic freedom, liberty, dem democratic vision. Let's unite, even with the folks we don't like. Okay, I'm not asking you to like folks. or as a, We have to join, because divided, we will perish. If there is a white, nationalist, patriarchal, Christian nationalist frame on this country that is getting power in order to deny everybody else who is not like them power, we're done. The democracy is over. And ladies and gentlemen, you and I will be on the boxcars to Manzanar too. Because we cannot allow genocidal, annihilative visions of you don't belong and you should not exist. That is what that vision is. No. We are e pluribus unum Americans, and we are going to achieve this democracy and the vision of this country, and we are going to perfect this union. We have to join together. We need a battle plan on several fronts, short term, medium, and long term. Short term is next week. We could lose this democracy. It's not 2024. The Democrats are always five years too late and a million dollars too short. I'm not, I'm not a member of any party. My cousin, I'm calling her up because, you know, it's Condoleezza. I'm like, where are you? You know, get out there and get your people in line. But bottom line, if, if we don't understand the frame that we are in and the battle that we are in. So short term right now is galvanizing for, to vote for people who believe in actual democracy, are not trying to end it for everybody. Medium term is the 2024, but it's not just about elections. It is about reaching out to the people who are so whipped into a frenzy of hatred, they believe that we are trying to kill them. If I believed what they've been told, if I believed what they've been told, I would think of us as an enemy too. They have been deprived of jobs. They have been deprived of it. They've been left in a rust belt. They feel like they're looked down on. They're cut out. They're not on television. They're, they're, they're the butts of joke, uh, jokes on television. Their cultures and their dances and their, and their, their, their entire way of living. They got rid of one, one, one of the taxi drivers told me in Appalachia, he said, you erased us. We're not even on television anymore. So stepping into that empathetic shoe, if I were in their shoes and I were whipped into a frenzy with lies, li path, that liaria, there's a new disease. It's an epidemic, okay? Yeah, yeah, there's, there's democracidal liaria going on, and the big lie will kill everybody, okay? What we have to understand is if we can't persuade, not everybody is unpersuadable, but we have to let them know we don't look down. We do want to include them. I am worried about poor white coal miners who have nothing but black lung disease, and then Medicaid is cut out from under them. We have to care about them too and tell them we are not out to exclude or annihilate them. We want them to be part of that tapestry. The call to action, let's get, they're going to call for a constitutional uh, 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 convention, but they want to get rid of a freedom constitution. We need to be ready with a constitution that actually talks about fundamental rights. The first, right to, the first human right is not the right to speech, it is the right to safety. The first freedom is not the freedom to associate. It is freedom from violence. We can write a constitution that builds in what the doctors and this panel were talking about, the right to shelter, the right to access to health care, the right to, sh the right, simply the right to achieve who you were meant to be, whom God meant you to be. All of those liberties. We could rewrite the Constitution, but we cannot let people who don't want us at the table. I tell people, there's nothing more American than being owned by America. I am the descendant of slaves and slave owners. My ancestors died to have me stand here. Join them in a continuing fight for our freedom and for democracy. Thank you. Thank you.